You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your hosts, Thomas Ahrens and Jared Mount. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle. Good evening, everybody. Welcome back. I'm your host, Thomas Ahrens, and my co-host, Jared Mount. How are you doing tonight? Doing well, Thomas. Yep. So, guys, it's the pilot episode, and before uh, Jared sh- uh, tells everyone about our special guest, uh, basically this podcast, we are highlighting all the fishing opportunities around the DMV area. This is not the DMV where you actually go to get your car registered. This is everywhere from PA, Maryland, West Virginia, Virginia, the D.C. area. There are so many fishing opportunities up here that you really don't know about. And so we're hoping to highlight all that from bank fishing to kayak to the big bass tournaments. So I think we have a special we have a special guest to bring in. Yeah, I'm really excited about this guest we have here today. And uh, I think, like I said, a lot of people still don't know about the opportunities that we have um, in our in our area. And um, you know, a lot of people are familiar with Bassmaster, um, and and we watch the Elite Series. Uh, the Bassmaster Classic is is a big kind of Super Bowl of bass fishing, and we, and we may be watching that on TV. Um, some people are familiar with the college uh, series, the college circuit as well, or the Bass Opens. Uh, every state has them. Uh, but a lot of people aren't aware of it, it starts as early as high school, uh, elementary and middle school, um, anglers. Uh, every state, just about every state is represented and has a high school program. Um, and it kind of feeds one into the other. So high school um you know tournaments and competition leads into collegiate if, if young anglers decide to do that uh they can go in the opens or elite series and the young man we have here today jeremy radford um watched him grow up here coming into jake's bait and tackle and, and he was just a little guy a uh, young young fella uh he would walk the aisles his dad would pick out certain things and Jeremy kind of followed him but then he would kind of venture off on his own and kind of bring get his own uh own lures and kind of show him his dad and his dad would kind of you know let him pick out certain things and and just watching him grow up um into a young man and then you know going into his sophomore year i believe it was um you know i was helping with with our local frederick county bass uh, team and uh, i knew he'd be a good candidate for this team and so uh you know talked to him and his father about you know getting him involved in competitive fishing and just really glad that he took advantage of that opportunity um, and so Jeremy Radford, we're going to be, uh, talking to him today. He's, uh, now a senior at Strasburg high school, uh, and he is fishing again, the high school Bassmaster tournaments with Frederick County, uh, bass. So Jeremy, thanks for coming and joining us here this evening. Absolutely. I, I really appreciate the opportunity to do this and see what we can do. With That's it. right. So, Hey, listen, I wanted to find out, you know, prior to joining the Frederick County bass team, uh, your sophomore year, tell us a little bit about your fishing experience. I've, I mean, I've always been on the water. Just, it's part of who I am. And me and my dad have always been on the water. Just having y'all here was a great opportunity to take it a little further. How old were you when you started fishing? Uh, it, it's hard for me to put an age on it, as long as I can remember. That's right. Yep. What species uh, fish, and then what species and like what bodies of water did you grow up? With? When growing up, my dad used to be a catfish guide on the James River, so that's what we would always do. Is we would always target the catfish. Then uh, around when I was ten or so, we started getting a little more into bass fishing. So it, it's it's always been there. Always something we did. That's good stuff. Um, so fast forward, uh, you join the Frederick County team your sophomore year, and then by your junior season, you end up. You end the season first in the state of Virginia based on points. Congratulations for that. Thank you. Thank you. I don't think uh, people realize how significant yeah. you know that is. Um, I think you're averaging 60 to 75 you know senior division teams, high school teams in the state of Virginia, yep. in the nor- just the northern division, and not quite as many in the southern division. Uh, tell our listeners, Jeremy, about your four qualifier experiences. And for those that don't know, uh, they have two qualifiers in, in the fall and two in the spring um, at different bodies of water. And they take anywhere from the top four or five in, in each qualifier that can qualify for a state tournament. Um, and they also do, do it based on points with each one. And that's what you end up winning uh, the state based on points. But what specifically did you do to put yourself in the top of the state uh, your junior year? What I, going into each tournament, I would... I knew I I couldn't catch the fish 
the way my style of fishing is. I knew I had to be away from the crowd. So I would always push to go as far and to where nobody else would go or could go. That's that's something that's always worked for me. For me. Just doing, getting getting yourself to new fish, the way I like to say it. How did you know mentally to do that? Like, it, I feel like when we're, we all are out there on the water, you have two voices in your head, and it's hard to figure out which voice is the right one to listen to. And, and have you learned over the years to, like, this is the voice I need to listen to? Uh, and being able to quiet that other voice? Like, how did you get to that? Absolutely. I mean, growing, I grew up on the Potomac River, and the Potomac River gets pounded. And you mm-hmm. get, you gotta, you're, you're either fishing around 60 boats or you're, or you're by yourself. And I was never a fan of being in a populated area, so I always, we always push to, to go find new water. And that's just what I've carried over, and it's, it's, it's worked for me. For me. Mm-hmm. Yep. And, Doing that, growing up on the Potomac, I, I can I've learned to take techniques from there and do it to other other lakes. Yeah, be, being I know like we all grew up on the Potomac River. Um, you know, there's always like there's always six spots that, and we could all probably list them off the top of our, our heads. Like that, that's where everyone goes. There's always 500 boats in there, and I feel like it, it breeds two types of anglers. It's one that wants to fight and will stay in the group, or one that leaves. Um, and but it also teaches you how to fish highly pressured waters. What was it like when you got to your first big body of water and actually for a big tournament? Because I knew like if you fish Mattawoman, that's almost like a mini Lake Frederick, and you could almost never leave Mattawoman and do okay. But then you go to Lake Murray or Kerr, and you're like, holy crap, this is big! Like, how did you mentally go from there to there? Absolutely. I mean, going growing up on the Potomac, yeah, the Potomac is a giant body of water, but you you can break it down into very small chunks. And you know, being on Lake Frederick, it's it's a sp- small water too. So my our first qualifier was on Kerr, and when we went there, I mean, it was it was overwhelming how big it was. So I just I told myself I'm gonna cut the lake into a small piece, and, not, and I'm not gonna leave that piece. And fortunate enough, that piece I picked was a great piece. I mean, I I like to keep it small, so it's not as it's it's easier for me to cover water. But if I find this and this, I can still cover it in the same day. Mm -hmm. Tides, like growing up on tides, we are, we, it's a, it's a curse and it's also can be very fruitful if you know how to play it right. And I think if you grow up here, yes, there's an advantage, but people don't talk about the disadvantage. I think where we don't have a lot of lakes and you could be a guy that literally just fishes the river, but then you go to a lake. And it's not under the same conditions of Mother Nature where you know a bite, low tide is going to be in 20 minutes, and at that point I have a chance to catch something. You're at a lake, it's, uh, you could just flip a coin because it could be in the morning, could not. Like, did that mentally you have to adjust where you're like, oh, crap, I'm not getting bit today. Like what, you see what I'm saying? Before you answer that, I want to just throw in too on that exact thing happened down at Gaston where we just, it seemed like, you know, it's, it's four or five hours away, and a lot of our teams had not fished Gaston, and, and we're competing against teams – down there that that's their mm-hmm. home water that's their backyard and so i think you know that's a great point thomas where you know mentally we were defeated before we went down there yes and and we didn't and, and i know travis luger you know spoke to our kids before that i think that one yeah. tournament and yep. just said basically hey guys you're putting your pants on one leg at a time you know that old adage and, and just go into it with with confidence and although you may not have fished this as much as, as the other anglers you know, go in as if you can win it. And so to Thomas's point, yeah, in that, in that particular tournament, I think you were first and we had a first and a yep. second and Jacob yep. and his partner ended up second. And, and we also had some junior qualifiers and we, as a team, Frederick County did very well in that body yeah, of water. So absolutely. speak to that mental part of fishing an unknown lake. I mean, my, my style of fishing, I love grass and gas and it doesn't have your hydrillas or your millfolds, but it's got full of grass. I mean, gra- to me, grass is grass. So anywhere I can find grass, I feel right at home. And that's exactly what we did. I mean, we went targeted shoreline grass, bone frogs and chatterbaits and the normal stuff that you would throw. And that it worked for us. And it, it was crazy. When we when we pulled up there, our first cast was called a three-pounder. It's like, yeah, well, maybe maybe I figured something out today. Is there a 12-inch limit in that tournament? I forget because does uh, that factor into there it? There was typically two. Um, there's two there's within two a 12 slots. to 14. Yeah. So you would two work fish, on the slot, too. To yeah. Oh, damn. Then, but, and the rest over 14. 
four turns for us, all of our fish were over. That. Okay, yeah. yeah. That, that's another way I like to look at it as well. If I catch them, if I find the right fish, I don't have to worry about <laughs> yeah. right. If they're all four pounds, you know right. where they're going. Yep. That's right. <laughs> they're all going in the box. Because there's also, I think, there's spotted bass there. Now, do you, like, if you ever go to these places now and you have different species, is it still, I'm only looking for the green ones? Yep. Or do you, fa okay. Absolutely. I mean, the way I, I look at it, you can catch nice spots there, but to me, if you if you want to win this tournament, you got to be around the largemouth, and that's the way my technique of fishing. I mean, mm -hmm. that's that's what we do. We we go find the biggest ones and stick with them. Do you own a depth finder, <laughs> <laughs> or do you just keep it as shallow as possible? Uh, <laughs> it's crazy. I, I actually on my boat, I'm running five. Oh my god, and I'm running five, and all turned off. <laughs> Ninety nine percent of the time, they are all turned off. <laughs> The only time I use, really, the only time I use them is when I'm on plane and don't want to hit no stumps. Mm -hmm. <laughs> stay, stay in my little path I got going. But I'm, I got it all. But I, I keep it basic. Mm -hmm. I, I go with my, what, my feelings and my thoughts, and always go with your gut. The way I've always grown up thinking about it. So the last thing I have on the on the mental side of it was your first multi day. How did you how did you feel about that? Did you change your strategy, or or did you mentally feel like you had to change your strategy too? I, I thought I would have to change my strategy, but when I when I started, it's like my my gut catching as much as I can, and I, the way I fish, I have a hard time filling out a limit, and catching quality fish has always been number one for me. So I, I like to swing for the fences and. It, it costs it cost me most of the time, but if you can catch it right. Mm -hmm. So when I went at nationals was a, was my first multi day tournament, and we it's like well, it's it's either I'm gonna do great or I'm not, and so I swung for the fence. It was it was going great. It was a great tournament, but fortunately, unfortunate we on day one we lost a, a giant picker fish right at, <laughs> right at the net. It was it was heartbreaking. I don't like saying how big the fish was because he was truly that big, but he was, he was a big one. And, but anyway, going back to it, I always my motto is swing for the fence, no matter if it's a four-day tournament or this little Wednesday nighter. Get us there mentally. What do you mean by swinging for the fence at, Chick uh, at Chickamauga? Like what, what, what was your game plan going into it? And I know we don't be here for six hours, but kind of cliff note, going into it, there is grass there. It is heavily pressured, but there is a good population of big ones. So did you just, when you say swing for the fence, is it like, I'm going to tie on a, a mag draft swim bait and just kind of just yellow it? Or was there something else that made you? Let me say real quick that? too, for the viewers. Uh, so with him being first in the state, again, he was a qualifier for that national tournament, which is again, pretty cool. Yeah. Number one in the state of Virginia. I mean, that, that's really saying yeah, let's something. Let's go back I mean, to that, I guess. No, no, yeah, that's yeah, good, yeah, though. Yeah. That's we'll lead jump a little. No, yeah. that, no, that's a good lead in to that. I mean, that's uh, let's talk about that uh, because that, you know, allowed you to be one of two teams in, in the state of Virginia to go fish that national tournament, Chickamauga in, in Dayton, Tennessee. And so, yeah, just, you know, talk to what he said as you go down there. And even leading up to that, what are some things you did prior to going there? Because you had never fished that body of water before. So what, what were some things you did to prepare for that? I know you went down there and pre-fished it, but going into it, what did you do to, to get ready and prepare for that, that on, national tournament? On any new tournament that I fish, on any new body of water, I always, I always try to do my research. Find, well, I'll get it on Google Earth or some type of map like that. And I'll, I'll, if I can find grass, that's, that's where I'm going. So I found my grass beds and did all my research and, you know, you, you got these things in the lake that tell you water temperatures and stuff like that. So I always try to do as much research before I go to a body of water. And so that way I have a little, so when I go there, I'm not afraid and, or like, I shouldn't say afraid, but bare, mm -hmm. have no clue what to do. So I like to have a little something to go off of, but leading to going to nationals, you had, we had a one month of off limits. So June off limits was the entire month of July. And so in June, the last week of June, we went down there for a week. And we fished, did a bunch of fun fishing just to have fun and find, can't say, can't really say find places, but just learn about the lake. And we, it was phenomenal. That, that week we were there, the lake was on fire. I mean, it seems like whatever you threw, you're catching fish over five pounds, whether you're mm -hmm. offshore or 
and six inches of water. It was unbelievable. That lake is truly mm. amazing. But how old are you again? I'm. I just. I turned 18 in April. 18 Damn. years old, and he's already experiencing. Uh, talking about five the pound big fish. Leagues, like, yeah. 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 I mean, that's, crazy. Yeah. It's. I can't. I can't speak enough about the lake. I mean, you really gotta. You really gotta see it to believe it. I mean, it is truly. It's like. A, it's like a storybook. I mean, everything you did. It's like. Oh man, there's a five pounder. Like, wow. <laughs> I mean, we'd roll up to a, a bush. We'd skip under it and. You work my frog, bam, eight pounders. Wow, I mean, this place is truly one of a kind. Wow. I'm, I'm so glad and so thankful that mm. that's where they decided to take the nationals. Mm. So, go, during that week, I had my he head up high, just the way everything went, which I knew in a month's time a lot can change, and which mm -hmm. it did. I mean, everything we did for during the month we were there in June, everything we did absolutely changed. We didn't, none of that. The grass, what what did it? The grass matted up so much in that one month to where the places we were getting, you just you just couldn't get to. The the hydrilla was so matted, you you cut mm -hmm. your trail motor on ten and you weren't wow. getting through it. Mm -hmm. and we we're we we're having to push our way out through the grass. That's just how thick it was. So that during pre fishing for the actual tournament, trying to go to the places where we fished prior, just so not being able to get there, kind of. Oh man, I'm kind of getting a little nervous now. So, and that place, it's it's crazy to say this, being a giant lake like that, but being a TVA lake, they they pull current, and that Chickamauga Lake fishes identical to a tidal water, which I thought was crazy. Mm -hmm. But another another reason it fit my style of fishing. I mean, when they would cut the dam on, there goes your low tide. Mm -hmm. Fish would start biting on key. It was crazy how it was. When they started pulling water, you were getting bit. If you weren't getting bit, you weren't around the fish. Did you? What's nice about tidal is God controls when that goes, and it's always. You don't know with when the TVA they pull it. How do you strategize that, or is it just like you hope they pulled at the right time that day? You're right. TVA actually has a has an app, but to what my knowledge, if they said they're pulling at this, they might be. Two hours before, or yeah. three hours later. So you're kind of basing yourself off a number that might be right. Mm -hmm. And on on the TVA, we the we had three days of official practice, and they they pulled current hard on the weekdays. But day day one of the tournament was on a Friday, and day two of the tournament was on a Saturday. And they mm -hmm. don't pull current during the week. I think it's because boaters and there's just a lot more traffic. Some something else that could go. Yeah. Wrong. And they're in practice, no matter where you're at, if you're around fish and they start pulling water, when they pulled water, they pulled water. I mean, current was moving. We hmm. we spent our time in the upper part of the lake, closer to the dam, so we were getting the full effect of the current that they were blowing through. And it was like a four or five mile an hour the current that was coming through. So it, it really positioned the fish great. I mean, if you had, I mean, at that time when they were pulling current, we were looking for eddies. We were hmm. like, being on the Shenandoah or mm -hmm. the New River, something like that. We were, I mean, it felt just like we were back at home. I mean, or being on the Potomac and outgoing tide. You just, they set so, they set so predictable when they would pull the current. And I've heard, you know, Nolan Miner talk about that. And you can't ever, like, whether you're kayaking or you're wading the river like you're talking about or, you know, it, any, any fishing experience, trout fishing, it doesn't matter. You're fishing a creek. Like, you're, you're applying those principles from, you know virginia that you grew up fishing the river down there in that you know mm -hmm. that setting that's pretty cool you know that's you can always learn from something from every body of water yeah, every fishing absolutely. experience you and hopefully apply it like you're saying in that in that situation that's pretty cool yep i mean everywhere you go you're always going to learn something mm -hmm. that you can carry to somewhere else mm -hmm. it's that that's that's why i love fishing so much because you're always learning mm -hmm. always mm -hmm. so what happened when they shut the power off <laughs> uh, it was like being on tidal water. It's like a light switch. You uh -huh. had to you had to go back to just keep on flipping or keep on casting. Just hope you get bit. I mean, yeah, you could get on a pattern where you could be around the fish, but when it when you're when they had the current on, it was you're getting bit. If you if you weren't, you just you need to go to a new area. So on Saturday when they cut the current, did you? assume did you mentally go into knowing like okay they're gonna pull less current so we need to pivot our strategy going into the day or it's like let's just go back through the same thing and then just figure it out like what was your thoughts going into saturday it was 
I, I knew they weren't going to pull. They they pulled a little bit of current, and luckily we had wind. But, okay. So that that helped us too. But I knew going into day two, when I knew it wasn't going to be the same. So we still did the same thing, but it just set the fish. The fish were more spread out. We had to cover more water in that time that we had, versus where day one the fish were. They were holding. They were letting tight to hard cover. It was just when we when we day one when we would go we first off day one I was boat number two seventy out mm-hmm. of the three hundred nine boat field so we had a we had a late take off so our uh, our starting spot was a to me was a bomb morning spot the way when because they pulled the current early in the morning and during practice we had a phenomenal practice there during practice we something new we found we just actually the way we found it we were going back to the boat ramp and ran out of gas oh it was raining wow. on us. and so we went we they were pulling current hard when we ran out of gas and we we're going up the river and so we we it was in a uh, channel swing and channels when the current would hit they would hit this side of the bank real hard and so we we had a trolling motor, we had a trolling motor across the river, and the, at that point the river's probably three miles wide. Mm. We, we we did kill our batteries when it was all said and done. With. <laughs> Good God! <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we trolling motor across, and we had the trolling motor on eight, and we were just go- booking it. We had we had uh, it was raining misty, so we had a I had a top water buzz bait in my hand. And we were just burning it. We had the trolling motor, and as fast as we could reel, we were getting bit. It was crazy going across and. You know, you, we'd have never fished there if if we didn't run it's out of amazing. gas. Amazing, yeah. And no sooner we get to the is there's hydrilla all along the bank. No sooner we get to that end, she made three casts and bam, three pounder. Mm. So, That's uh-oh. awesome. Uh-oh. Sometimes things just work it, they out. work out. Yeah. Like you take a negative and it turned into a yeah. positive. Because you're exactly right. If you run out of gas, you get a buzz right past that. And yeah, exactly. Bounce. Absolutely. I mean, so if, if it wasn't for running out of gas, I wouldn't know what I would have done there. Right. At least at least to start my morning because sure. During the morning tournament, I had my morning spot. Then, like clockwork, around 9 30, 10 o'clock, I was leaving no matter what. No matter if I had one fish or three fish, had a full limb, I was leaving. Anyway, back to finding it. There's the way it set up is the channel came close to the grass. And that's what, once we caught that fish, we started putting mm. pieces together and why they were there, why we thought they were there. And the channel hug, hugged that grass line tight. We went from it's crazy. I've never been somewhere and be in eight foot of water and just have matted eye drill. It was just unbelievable. But you'd go from eight foot to sixteen foot almost in a hurry, an instant. So it's like, well, all right, that makes sense. Conditions we have, these fish are supposed to stack up right. What you read in Bassmaster magazines, like they're they're supposed to be here. Mm-hmm. So follow on. We found that on the final day of practice. It's like, all right, we didn't really have much going into it. So day one of practice, we had. We had a late number. We were towards the end of uh, the flights. So we got we left the we got through boat check at let's say close a little after eight. Mm. And like I said a little while back, at nine thirty to ten o'clock, when the sun really got got up, that bite went away instantly. Mm. So something told me on day one, I might be costing myself going up there, just because it was it was a strictly morning deal. And we got there. Luckily, we had a little bit of fog, so that that kept us there a little longer than what we'd like to say. But we caught one fish up there. It's like, well, I, I can't get the surge because this is what, exactly how I thought it would be. Is mm-hmm. what happened. Mm-hmm. Round we we missed our morning bite, so we ran further down the lake. We it was we were up closer towards the dam, and where our our Later in the evening where we would go, it was way down the lake. So it was like a 20-mile run, 20, 30-mile run. So that that didn't help matters none because we were, we were stressed a little bit, which we shouldn't be because check-in was 4.30, I think, 4.30, 5 mm-hmm. o'clock. So that, that put a little added pressure on mm-hmm. and not having a, a fish in the boat yet. Mm-hmm. And it being my biggest turn in my life. So there, wow, there's a lot, a lot of, of – yeah. yeah. There's a lot, a lot of pressure. Going on. Yeah. And when we – we got down there's this giant grass flat 
I don't want to say too much about the grass flat because it is a community all there, and it is deep grass, and there's keys, highlights, stuff, high, highlights of the grass that we are looking for. I mean, we are in 15 foot of water fishing hydro. It is crazy just being in that deep water and feeling like you're on the Potomac and mm-hmm. three foot of water fishing. Right. Grass. But we are, a lot of how we fished was not so much off our graphs, but most of our stuff was based off our mapping, our chip. And having those one foot contour lines really mm-hmm. helped us to see those break lines in that grass. So, take it back. The final day of the practice, we were, I was, I love throwing Carolina. So I was dragging a Carolina rig in the grass. And there's boats all around us, which was kind of unfortunate, but I felt good. I kind of felt at home. And we were making these long. It's, what I learned, the farther you can cast, the higher your chances of to get bit. Because there's so many boats there, and I think the fish are keyed in on hearing boat motors and trolling motors. Pressure, just like the Potomac River. Absolutely, absolutely. And when we when we we came down off plane, it's like, well, all right, this looks good. I I can I can get down with this. So we just stood up and started casting. And if you fish grass a lot, you'll know that there's highlights and there's not so good spots. Mm-hmm. Whether or not you got a shallow bar or you got dead grass, there's always a highlight to a big grass spot. And I think we found that highlight because first cast caught caught a twelve inch. All right, there might be something to this. Then a little while, got further up this break. All right, three pounder. Like, oh, we, we might be putting on something. So at this point, I made. I told myself, I'm gonna make one more cast. Then I'm gonna take my hook off so I don't mess these fish up. Were, were you? I'm sorry. Were you and your partner doing the same thing with the Carolina rig, or did you guys do different things? We were throwing. We were both throwing a Carolina rig. Okay. I was throwing a big Carolina rig because I'm I'm a straight up power fisherman, which he was throwing a finesse Carolina rig on spinner rod. Gotcha. Two, same bait, just different sizes. And then what was your strategy with a teammate? Were you guys both in the front fan casting out in front, or how were you trying to pick apart this football field of vegetation? On being that we were in a massive grass flat, we could get away with me up front, him in the back. We could okay. get away. There's plenty of room where we can just make casts all around us. Once during the tournament, we both fish up front because we were more okay. we were more concentrated on what we needed to cast at. Back to practice, I made I told myself I'm gonna make one more cast before because I didn't want to mess up my fish. So I said take a hook off. Made made this cast and I don't know what it was about. It's like man, something that says let's just look at my graph and we're gonna we're gonna parallel this break. And I made this cast and it, it was a long cast. I was throwing, I was, I was throwing an eight foot rod, so I, I could really get this Carolina rig out there. And I let it sink down to the bottom, and I just started dragging it, dragging it. And all the fish we were catching, if it was, it was crazy. If they're under, it seems like if they're under three pounds, they're you could you could feel it. it sound they felt like a tank hit them. Then a couple, I've I've learned I've caught some big fish on a Carolina rig, and when you catch those bigger fish, you don't really feel the bite. You just your, your rod just starts loading up. It's just something, yeah. It's heavy. It's just start loading up. So I was dragging along, dragging along. And it's like, oh, that's that's different. I haven't felt that in a while, but that's different. So I set the hook up. And note, there's boats surrounded us. And I was trying to be kind of stealthy about it. So when I set the hook, I, the fish immediately jumped up. And she was a giant. <laughs> Absolute giant. And I reeled her in. And she's like, looking at him. It's like, man, that's a big fish. And I didn't want her to jump. So I was... I was standing up, but just had my rod in the water, so I didn't want people to see us. So I was running, 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 just winching as fast as I could to get her back to the boat. Then once she got closer, I was kind of be trying to be sneaky, so I sat <laughs> sat in the console and acted like I was playing on the graph while I was still fighting this fish. And she she was big. I don't I don't really I didn't get her in the boat because I was playing with her long enough where I didn't want it because there's a boat. There's literally a boat 30 yards from us. Over, under five. Over. Over. Over Oof. five. She, she's a big fish. Then, as I'm fighting her, I got her, I literally got her right beside the boat. I thought about getting her in the boat, but there's, like I said, there's a boat right beside us. And I, I didn't want to see him because just another thing I would stress about. And sitting here fighting her, I had my rod in this hand, just playing her, 
trying, I didn't want to try to get her off, but I was, I wasn't, I wasn't in a huge hurry of getting her in the boat. Mm -hmm. So right at the boat, she came off. It's like, all right, we don't even need to fish here anymore. We're going to go. We got a game plan. What I thought we would have a game plan. It is 2021. Why the Carolina rig? Like that is such an, <laughs> I, like there are so many different things. Like I feel like I will dredge the bottom and I can throw a Nico rig or maybe a, a really heavy, like shaky head in the grass, something like that. But why that is such an old school thing. Like where, where did that come from? Like, has that always been part of your repertoire? Or is that something new that you picked up? Um, I've always kind of thrown it, but I never really liked it. <laughs> not Until that you moment. Do now, yeah. Uh, yeah, I do. <laughs> I, I didn't really like it. But this year, I found a new technique that works for me. And on the Potomac, I was very successful when the grass first started coming up in Carolina. And right there in that particular spot that we were fishing, the grass wasn't completely matted. So, so I, this wasn't matted stuff you're bomb casting a one-ounce weight we into. Were, yeah. Okay, got well, it. Well, there's... It was crazy. We had matted grass here and matted grass here, and this little break line didn't have no matted grass in it. So I could get away. I could get away with dragging a Carolina rig. Part of me thinks that my we were in such deep water. Part of me thinks my bait never, my weight never actually mm. touched the bottom. I think um, it was just climbing up the grass mm -hmm. Yeah. But anyway, that that's that's for another story. Is there's certain things I do that are. I like to kind of keep secret. No, no, you're my, fine. My, my yeah. little, well, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. But but I also like how he breaks things down. You can tell his mind. You're always thinking. You're 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 noticing things, details. Yeah. Um, yeah. And you're putting it together. You're putting that puzzle yeah. together. Because like uh, that's a Lake Champlain Northern thing is doing the 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 Carolina rig, and I think it was Hartman that went on Champlain throwing a Carolina rig, which is crazy. It's like I I don't remember the last time I threw a freaking Carolina rig, but it's something about it with the grass that guys like to do it yeah. and i just feel like it is a pain in the freaking ass i can't especially I when it comes to rigging i i can't mm. stand the rig of carolina rig i just it, having to tie your do your pre leaders mm. and now do you have like three or four rods set with your conlar rig so you don't have to tie it in the tournament or do you I'll, do swim bait tackle so they ain't never breaking off well that was actually that's what that's why well, i'll tell that part in a little bit but i would i wish i had enough I didn't, I don't, the particular rod I was throwing was, was a uh, cash, the cashing rod is a 7-Eleven crankbait rod. Really? Yeah. And it was, it was a heavy rod and it was, the, it was at the time when I was just starting to play with Carolina rig, it was the longest rod I had. And what you always hear is like the longer your rod, the mm -hmm. better, easier it is to cast. So that was what I had. And I come to find out that rod sets up perfectly for the way I set my hook and mm -hmm. It was a to me it was a perfect rod to throw the Carolina rig on, and I was throwing. I was throwing twenty two pound, no no I, I lied. I was throwing forty pound braid to a fourteen pound leader, which was which was is is scary, and I knew I was risking it, but it was getting bit. It was okay. getting bit. It was working. And I don't know if I went up in line size. I don't know if I'd mm. get the same bite. In mm. the way it was. And I was throwing it on mono. Smart. Oh, really? Yeah, I was throwing it on mono. Just to me, I think it, which it can't hurt it, but to me, I think it helps that bait rise up yeah. as you're dragging it. And I was throwing it on, throwing, using a, throwing a three eighths. I was throwing a really light weight for what I was fishing and the depth. I was throwing a three eighth ounce tungsten weight, a woo tungsten weight. And we would, uh, Anyway, we'd make these long bomb casts as far as we could cast and just start dragging it. Just painfully slow, painfully slow. I mean, as slow as we could drag it. Were it, you the only one doing, like, the care? I mean, you can tell by the rods, like, what people are kind of doing. Do you think that helped you guys, that you were just doing it a little differently than everybody else? You you fish in the Potomac, fishing grass flats. You, you, you can, you're always watching to see what other people, that's mm -hmm. just what fishing yep. do. And... You know, you know that sound of a sinko. Yep. And that's all. That's it's crazy. That's all we heard. Just a lot of kids were throwing spinner rods, just dragging a sinko around. So hmm. we we started off doing it because that that's it works on the Potomac. So let's try it here. So so it, immediately it's like man, everybody else is doing this. So I'm gonna switch it up. You I'm knew. Yeah. I'm gonna do something different. So I tied on the Carolina rig and started getting bit. Then I called. I got that 
giant sister, but she 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 wasn't actually the giant. And after that, after that fish, it's like, what? what no, we're done. We're leaving. And at this point, this was like eleven thirty in the day. We still had till dark to fish. So it's like, man, what else? What else can we? Because we had we we already had a set game plan on what we were doing. So the rest of the day was pretty much fun fishing. It's like, man, what else is out there that we can do? We we didn't find we couldn't get bit doing anything else, and we went back to that grass flat right before we went in. I caught another fish, like twelve inches. Like, All right, there's something there's something to this spot. Mm-hmm. So day one of the tournament, we had our late blast off, got in, and it messed up. I can't say it messed up, but we had we didn't have as much time to fish our morning, morning bite. Yeah. yeah, so we went. We went to that grass flat, and we didn't have no fish in the boat. And this was ten thirty, so but luckily we had a four. I can't. I don't exactly remember. But it was four thirty or five o'clock weigh-in, and we got there, got to our row of waypoints. It's crazy looking at the graphs. I mean, it, we probably had five hundred waypoints in this mile stretch. So wow. it, was, it was crazy. We, I mean, we had that break. It seemed like to me we had it break dialed in for sure. All you had to do was look at those waypoints and cast. And we would get, we got to our first waypoint. It's like, all right, got the net out. Because on that long run, we we strapped everything mm-hmm. down. We didn't know how the weather was. There's a lot of boats in the water. So we strapped it down and put our net away. So first thing we do, got up, uh, got the net out, got it, just got everything situated and got everything ready. Because I, I t- told my partner, he said, man, if it's anything like it was yesterday, it shouldn't take long for us to get bit, and that was exactly what happened. I mean, we, <laughs> as soon as we got there, we, we came up a little short because we didn't want to take a chance of the boat and stuff spooking anything. So we came up a little short. So we were fishing this kind of, this we were just blind casting really until we got up to our spot. So once we got up there, it's like, man, it's game time. You come up here, and we're just going to start making these bomb casts on this uh, break. And I don't know, we probably cast five times and you know, you're dragging it Dunk, hammer and so we really told him get the net get the net she's coming and it was a three pounder it's like all right all right maybe maybe it's not over yet so we put her in the box t- took her care of her put a it was so hot we had we actually froze a carton milk jug mm. and so we could keep our water it was hot yeah. a couple of degrees cooler one month, July. we were in the last yeah, the last week of July. July yeah. I think it was the thirty first, the thirtieth through the first of. What's your water temperature? Uh, it was hot. Ni- it was in the high eighties. <laughs> eighties, yeah, hot. Yeah. It, it may have been in the nineties, but I, I don't God. exactly remember. But it, it was hot. I mean, the daytime high on day one of the tournament was over a hundred. Wow. I Lord. felt so bad for my dad, though, my captain. I mean, he had he had it. I, I told him the day before, it's like, man, it's going to be super hot. You should get an umbrella room or an umbrella put over so you can stay kind of kind of cool and sit in the seat all day. I felt so bad. I would look back at him, and he'd have a towel and everything draped over oh his head. Oh, my he'd God. stick the towel no, in the water, get it enough. wet. Yeah. <laughs> I, I really did feel bad for him. Cause well, was, shout out to Paul Radford, too. I mean, yeah. he, your dad has always been very supportive of you. Absolutely. And, you know, he part of kicking asphalt and just as – always been behind you and your mom and your dad, you absolutely, know, and, uh, you know, shout out to him and all Did the parents glare out there at you that, uh, at all. Cause my dad would do that. If it's 200 degrees, you're not catching anything. And he's wasting he, his time. You're like, you son of a bitch. You better get this going here. <laughs> it was, it was never to that point, but I, I could look back at him. He would look at me. Mm-hmm. You can just tell, you can just tell he was, it's really one thing if it's a nice day, but it's yeah. like yeah. 120 yeah. degrees. It, it was, it was crazy during practice, you know, highs and, the eighties, low nineties, yeah. but day one of the tournament, I swear it. When my dad said when he got in the truck to back down the ramp, the truck said one hundred and sixteen. Oh my gosh! Oh yeah. lord, it was, that's it, nuts. It was oh, that's especially terrible. your midday and the fat yep. suns and yeah. That's why we. That's going to the tournament. No matter what, we we're going to bring ice, mm-hmm. and so we could keep the water a little cooler. But mm-hmm. I'm so glad we we took the time mm-hmm. to, to do that to take uh, quart size milk jugs. We we bought the water jugs, then we we freeze them. We had a little, we had our boat cooler that we kept with drinks full mm-hmm. of water. 
then we have this little cooler in the floor just just for the fish because to me number one the number one priority for what the whole reason why we're doing this podcast is fish care mm-hmm. fish mm-hmm. care is everything because without them at least for me i would i wouldn't i wouldn't be here without the bass so to me bass is everything that's cool but Getting a little sidetracked now. No, you're fine. No, 100%. Another <laughs> quick shout, shout out to William Milam, is, is his yeah, partner. Abso- and, yeah, absolutely. And he was, uh, those two hit it off. And uh, William is actually in Ohio right now. Yep. And he went to diesel mechanic school and yep. he said he's working on big old combines yeah, or something. So uh, he uh, texted me a little bit ago and working on a giant yeah, tractor. There you go. That's awesome. Well, hey, you're not here, William, but uh, you're, you're still here in spirit. So. Absolutely. Absolutely. And back, back to the tournament, we, Keep going down this break, caught a couple fish, had a limit. Or no, I'm sorry, we didn't have a limit. When by the time about by twelve o'clock we had two fish in the boat. And we were we we knew we were pushing it. And we kept going down this break. Made at this time we done made three passes on this break and just keep catching fish. We caught we caught a couple short fish. So that kind of kept us up, knowing we're still around the fish. Mm-hmm. Then <clears throat> <laughs> Here's where about to, about to get the good part. Every time I, I've, it seems like every time I've told this story, I get choked up. I mean, we we were going back down the break and starting to wave back up, and uh, we make it about 15 yards. At once we get to the waypoints, and I make this long bomb pass, and I don't know why, but it seems like this cast is further than the rest of them. You remember those weird ass details? <laughs> it's it's, it's crazy. God. Oh I mean, my god! I, I yep. can remember every single thing I did on that cast. <laughs> And anyway, um, as soon as it hit the bottom, it felt like I felt it just got heavy. It's like, man, I know what this bite is. I mean, this is just, I know what this bite is. So I reeled down, throwing a Carolina rig, throwing that long rod. You really, what Do I you going, crow hop backwards with that thing? Like, no, I don't. <laughs> I, I probably should. But I was throwing an ultra light wire hook, just another way I could think my bait could suspend a little bit mm. better. So, and I knew it may cost me. Oh God! Because so, <laughs> all the fish we were catching prior to that, as soon as they touched the net, they're as soon as they touched the net, they're the hook was they're coming on fish. Oh, so just God. just keep that part in mind because that that's another key part of it of this story. And so we uh, so I told him it's like man, get the net. Here she is, this giant. And this was a long bomb cast. I mean. She came up to the surface. She jumped. She was probably 30 yards out there. And I've caught some big fish. I've caught a bunch of solid fish. And when she jumped, I was like, man, here she is. This is this is what dreams are made of. This is a giant. When you say big fish, you're talking 9, 10 pounders, I think. I mean, yeah, Lake I mean, Frederick last year, you had one a in little, a spawn that was yeah, 9, I think. It, she, was, she was a little over 11. Over 11. This was probably yeah, at least so he, 6. Worst yeah. case scenario, it's 6. Easy, right? <laughs> well, it's more than that, I think. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Because, like, just to hold paint it, like, how much do you think you in live well at this point, weight-wise? Going – during practice, we thought – I went into the practice thinking it was a five-fish limit every other turn. But due to outstanding for bass to think of this and doing this, I mean, it was so hot. They actually made it a three fish limit just for right. the fish care. Smart. It's just that. I mean, that's cutting your fish mm-hmm. depths in half, really. And so we had two fish in the boat for about about four pounds, five pounds. Yeah. Okay. Two fish. So for the viewers at home, at this point in the story, he's got two in the box. He needs one more. He's got about five pounds, you think, yep. and then you yep. you lean back on something. Yep. And so I wa- I watched this fish jump and man this is a giant get the net and who i'm starting to get worked up about <laughs> he's twitching you're gonna start twitching dude like dude she was we're wow. to get a whiskey sponsor if we're gonna be telling these type of stories <laughs> yeah right <laughs> <laughs> and uh anyway i'm i'm winching her in winching her in i, I didn't want to get her in the grass i knew i was throwing a lighter tackle especially when i saw her i knew I, if she got in the grass that was over with she straightened my hook out breaking she's she's massive so I'm reeling as fast as I can. I got my rod because when she came up and jumped, I was like, "Man, she can't do that either," and I don't want her in that. So I, so I just I, I worked with her, kept her kept her in that happy spot, and so I'm winching her in, winching her in, and my partner he's he's right here beside me, ready with the net. I mean, he's itching just as well as I am, and uh, I'm wheeling and wheeling her in, and at this point she's 
15 feet from the boat, and I got her on top of the surface, and she's skiing across the water. I was like, man, she's caught. She's caught. She's skiing across the water. He goes down to stick the net in, and when she goes in the net, I mean, the fish was so big where, you know, it seems like everything we do felt like, you know, in slow motion. Mm. I mean, when she was skiing across, it felt like she skied for 100 yards. Yeah. It was crazy. Yep, yep, yep. And uh, he goes down, and no no, no fault to him. She was so big, she <laughs> she didn't fit in the net. Oh, my God. And if, if anybody out there owns a skeeter, skeeter comes with, comes with the net. And it's a fairly nice size net. And when I saw her, I was like, look at the net. I was like, All right, yeah, this this would be fine. She's coming in the net. She's skiing across. He goes down the net. And the fish was so big where it was it was hard for her to fit in the net. And like I said before, all the fish that we were catching popped off the net. Every single one. It's just the way they were eating. They were, they were kind of eating kind of funny. I don't know if it was conditions or, or what. Maybe the plastic I was throwing. And... When she when she hit the net, the hook popped off. And this this is where I get heartbroken. Because at this point, I thought it was a caught fish. I mean, it's done and over with. And those who who want to know the size of the fish, I don't know exactly how big the fish is. I've caught two fish. One was over ten, and one was a little over eleven. Let me say too, like, where can people follow you? Like, what's your Instagram? My they can uh, find me Jeremy Rafford Outdoors. Same with uh, Facebook too. And the only reason I say that is because it is some people, you know, you're not a fisherman. We can stretch the truth. Absolutely. We can like yeah. Yeah, talk and it gets bigger the long. But yeah. for me, it's one of those things if when you see fish that he's caught, like he's he's caught the double digit. And yeah. so he, he knows what he's talking about. He's not just it sounds like a fish story, but you know, I know I know what you're telling us is true. And so No, a hundred percent. And and something I learned early on when I did college is you got dude we got to get you a GoFundMe for a GoPro. You need to have that oh, thing yeah, on. Yeah. That's a good <laughs> And you'll point. never turn wow. it off just the, to have the, the content. The, the heartbreaking part of the story, <laughs> other than the fish un, ends up coming off, but the heartbreaking, it was so hot. Every day around lunchtime, my camera would overheat. Oh, my mm. God. I, of course. Oh, wow. Of course. Look, uh. it, got, it got me catching the fish before. Because mm. going back, the reason I wanted it, I run a GoPro because I've been disqualified in a championship. And so since then, there's no fault. Well, it was my fault. We were in a uh, jet boat mm. and our my fault. And th- I even took responsibility some because in yeah. the rules it says you're not allowed to yeah. have a jet boat. And and it was and, my fault for not. And I was, I've been relatively new mm. too. And we didn't even think, well, you'd fished in it before. Yeah. You know, so. And I, I will say too, though, I was very impressed with. After the disqualification, I remember I remember going up to them and apologizing and just you know, I felt terrible. Uh, but I remember your dad saying, "This will never happen again." Yeah. And that's when you guys <laughs> went into yeah. the skeeter. Yeah, we. But, uh, but there was never like you guys never like it almost like it was almost like it motivated you it, for it the did. next season. It that did. was your sophomore season. Mm-hmm. It's like that was the motivation you needed. You yep. know what? I'm going to come back. And I'm going to be in the right boat, and, yep. and I'm going to show everybody I'm the best in the state. So yep. it's what Absolutely. I felt. And I think you you handled yourself well because you could have taken that, and that could have just kind of, you know, but yep. you didn't. You used that you gotta, motivation. You got to – when when it was, it was super unfortunate that that happened. But you got to take those, and you got mm. you got you to grow with them. You got to overcome them. You got to be stronger with them. I still can't believe he's 19 years old. He's talking yeah. like he's. I mean, <laughs> and especially a sport that probably has a worse winning percentage than a that's major league right. baseball that's player. Right. Abs- like, absolutely. You fail more than you. You got to be willing to lose in this sport. Mm-hmm. I mean, but I think I think that's why I do it. the the drive it takes to be out there every day. Be out there when it's when you get mm-hmm. in the truck and it says 116. Mm-hmm. I mean, be out there when it's 15 degrees and you got ice on the ground. I mean, it, that's that's why I do it. I love that. I mean, it's it's just it's what gets me going, and back to back to back to when we were on the boat. This fish was so big, we were all we were the way you gotta say it, we were all choked up. I mean, mm-hmm. this fish was an absolute. Giant. You feel like you watch somebody just get hit by a car in front of you. Like I, that's the way I express it to when, my brothers. Like when you're the just fish, in shock. When I watched her come <laughs> yeah. up in the net. When she 
I thought it was a, what what made it so hard for me is I thought I truly thought it was a caught fish because she was scanned across the top, mm-hmm. and you know you, you're with your buddy or you're with somebody and you go to grab a net and he gets this fish to scan and it, it's coming in the net. I mean that's I mean, so when I saw that, it's like man, this is done and over with. I this fish was so big, it's like man, before as soon as it started skiing, I told my dad because I thought it was, at this point I truly thought it was caught fish. I said man, we got to go and wait. We can't afford this fish, this cow. We can't afford anything happen to her due to how hot it was. Mm-hmm. So we saw, I maybe this is why it didn't happen, but I said, man, we got to go way in early because this fish was truly that big. And she, the second she hit the net, because she was so long, she she hit the net funny. Nothing, nothing to my partner's fault. I mean, I mean nothing he could have done different. And she was just so massive. When she hit the net, the hook popped off. When she hit, was so she was moving so fast, she kind of bounced off. When she bounced off, I was like, man, I was I was heartbroken. I I usually don't get spun out, mm-hmm. or no, that that's something that happens when you're bass fishing. But like, I'll pretty lose. even keel. You're pretty. Yeah. You stay pretty. Even. Yeah. When I lose a fish, yeah, you stand back up and keep doing it. But this fish truly. I've never had a panic attack before. At least I don't think I have. But that day, I I think I had a panic attack. Yeah, I think I, we all would. I stood back up. It took me because I had a, I automatically moved high because it just I don't know maybe to help calm myself down. And those who wanted who want me to say the number of how big I think this fish was, she was she was a teenager. Let's say life changing. This fish was life changing. I mean, she was she was a teenager. She was the eleven pounder I caught. Which my scales, I've heard, I've heard both say. Some people think that this that fish was bigger. The fish I caught was that was eleven pound, was twenty six and a half inches long. I mean, she was twenty six and a half by nineteen, and absolute giant. Mm. And that was at Lake Frederick. That, yes, that was at Lake Frederick. Yeah, you had she, video of that with, with the scales. Yeah. Yeah. So that's legit. Yep. after after this this trauma, where where are we sitting after this day of the tournament? To be able to uh, we were sitting, close up the story. We were we were sitting down down there in the back. I want to say we were, when we weighed in, we were around 80th place. Okay. 83rd. And this is day one? This is day one. Yes, this is day one. And it's hard for me. I shouldn't have said it, but I knew after losing that fish, that, that affected me. I knew, mm-hmm. I, I, knew I, I knew I wasn't going to make it to the final day. I just, this fish, and being a three fish limit is, I don't want to say it was easier for people to catch a limit. But it was those those key fish. But it was easier for people to catch. Yeah, those, those key fish pushed me. If you, it seems like if you had just about all the kids that made it to the final day, all had that kicker fish that you need. So yeah. I, I was, I was kind of, I was, I was truly heartbroken. Not only losing the fish in the biggest tournament I've ever done, but I mean that that was that was an absolute giant. That put you at the top. That put yeah. you right at the right where you needed mm-hmm. to be. She was she was. She was at least a teenager. I mean, mm-hmm. I don't. I'm not gonna say what I think she was, because mm-hmm. that. I mean, every time I tell a story, I mean, my chest starts pounding yeah. and I just get sick to my stomach. So then you're back at the hotel. You're drinking. Um, you're thinking about your next plan for the next day. What? What? How? How did that go mentally? Um, like in the darkness of your room when you're there with your thoughts, because that's what it's happened to me yep. before. It's happened to all of us, yep. especially multi days when you suck or something bad happens day one. And now you have the drive from the boat ramp to the hotel, and then you're just sitting there. Like, what? How did you wrestle those demons? <laughs> it, it it was it was hard, but at this point, it took me it took me a solid hour to get over to myself because I would mm-hmm. just, I mean, I tied, retied, and I stood up, started casting again. But every time I'd make a certain cast, I could see it happening again. Every time yeah. I'd make this certain whatever, I mean, I can see fish coming off, or I can just get this rush of adrenaline that it's like man this can mm-hmm. happen again and i think that's why i pushed myself like i did because i knew because like i said before the day before i caught a giant it was almost the identical cast that same little i don't know what was there and why they were linked to it but there's there's always a fish there but when going like you said when i was with my thoughts it's like man it might be over, but we're we're gonna we're definitely gonna swing for the fences now. So we did the exact same thing, and luckily, 
being towards the end of the flight on day one, we got a pretty good um, draw all day two. Yeah, yeah. we we're I think we we're the third flight out. There's nine or ten flights. And day one, we we're the ninth flight out or the eighth flight out, and day two, we we're the third flight out. And so we, as fast as my skier would go, we would go. We went up to our morning spot, fished this. It was about two miles where the current really hit this grass the hardest. We we ended up catching a limit there. It wasn't a good limit. But you finished out the tournament yeah. for your first time at the national championship, which sometimes it's yeah. you know. Yep. We uh we got there and we caught three fish, three you know solid one. Our biggest one up there was two pounds. So, like clockwork, we went from at nine thirty, ten o'clock. We went back to our grass. It's like, man, we're they were here the last two days. Maybe we can get one, another one, and caught one as soon as we got there. First cast, it, it was, it was, it didn't call. It was a keeper, but it didn't call. Then we kept on going, and like, oh, uh, we made another long bomb cast, just like the day before. It's, it's, it's crazy how you remember certain stuff, certain certain mm -hmm. stuff with certain fish. And I broad loads up. It's like, uh oh, th this is another big fish. And we ended up getting this fish in the boat. It was right at five pounds on, the, on day two of the tournament. And this what check in was <coughs> two no check in was three o'clock. So it that kind of hurt us too fishing down there because we had we had a mm -hmm. rush or something. So we went back. That was the, all the fish we caught down there. We ended up catching that five pounder, which. That kind of hyped our spirits some, which I, I knew it wasn't quite enough. So we, we drove back up to the uh, boat dock and weighed in. It, it, was, it was awesome the way they had mm -hmm. it set up. I mean, it's like what you see on TV on Bassmaster. I was going to ask you, like, your experience off the water. Too. It, like, yeah. I mean, you, you, it you was, can't ever be fishing, but then how was it? It was so so phenomenal. You go to the weigh-in, you get to see it, and then, like, just paint it for our audience there. So they, they're done fishing day two. You're back there. What is that all like? It, it was it was truly amazing how they set it up. Being, you know, we don't we don't have really these big tournaments in mm -hmm. Virginia. We have occasional open mm -hmm. and stuff like that. But going there and experience how it was all set up. I mean, it was, and the way Bass handled it all. I mean, they're in, in Dayton at the boat dock. I mean, there's 309 boats and. They, I mean, they said they, they said that we have a 15 boat minimum or a method. In 15 minutes, we can get 100 boats out. Wow. Huge shout out to Bass for putting on a fantastic oh, absolutely. event. Absolutely. I mean, you were that, telling me about that the last tournament, the yeah. first qualifier this year. They were just so impressed with how they got that many boats. Same 300 boats. I mean, that's and that always yeah. amazed me too. This mm -hmm. sport, how you can get all those it, boats it's crazy. on the water, it's crazy, get yeah. them off logistically, and get them back. I mean, it's it's incredible and for absolutely. people that haven't seen it or fished it like I, it's interesting too to see new uh anglers coming in they're just you know they are impressed by yeah the when we we had a we couldn't take the boat out to then mm -hmm. pull our fish out so we had a motor to the vent and it was awesome how it was all set up we'd pull up right behind the scales bag our fish and we would walk we would go to the uh, Waymaster, grab our mesh bag, switch our fish in, we'd go to the tanks. It is, I mean, it's truly like how you see on the lead series, watch TV, and you'd sit in your tanks, and you'd go up, then you, you walk across the stage, and you call your name out, and when you call your name out, your adrenaline just floods, and it was, it was awesome. Yeah, I remember our first national championship with FLW, that's now MLF, and it's just like the tanks and the crowds. Like, yeah, that was the, the crowd too. Being on live, it was, it was uh, Oh, my awesome. God. Because even when we did, we had regional championships. So you had to win or finish high. And then you had to compete in a regional championship and then do something there before you go to the nationals. And the regionals were okay crowds. I think it was on the Potomac and the Chesapeake one year. It was okay. But you go to the nationals, like, good yeah. God. There yeah. is, like, a crowd yeah. there. Yep. I mean, figure, I mean, there's 300 competitors. Then you got families and this people from around that want to come watch. I mean, there's, it was, it was crazy mm -hmm. where everybody was standing was probably, I don't know, it was probably four acres. I don't know, that, that might be exaggerated, but it, it was it was cool. a giant chunk mm -hmm. of land. I mean, it was full. As far as you can see, there's people. It was awesome. Was cool. So where did you guys finish up for the for the tournament? The entire tournament, we ended up finishing 53rd. Out of? 309 boats. That's still it's very not, impressive. It's not bad. In any other sport, that, that'd be really awesome, yeah. right? <laughs> 
That is really, really yeah. awesome. Yep. So, so to kind of put a bow on it tonight, what did you guys do good, and what would you guys do different? What well, to do differently? I don't think there's anything I would have done differently. I mean, it it just wasn't in our hands. It wasn't meant to be. Mm. I mean, for that, it was, it was super unfortunate for that fish to come off. But he's he's always got a plan. And if it wasn't meant to be, it wasn't meant to be. That's what, I tell you what, that is a great attitude to have. Yeah, you, I'm just yeah. I'm super impressed with your just your uh, just how you you speak and your well your your mental uh, approach to these things. Because again, that I mean it wrecks you. But oh you're, my god, but yeah. You're handling it very well, and you have a great perspective on on. And Hill Thomas will tell you uh, with baseball and and what he's referring to too is starting the fishing uh, team at Shannon University. Uh, but it's how sometimes successful people it's how they handle defeat. it's the adversity and yeah. adversity how they yeah. handle that determines if how they whether or not they it have does. success. It really does. You can't let that. <clears throat> You can't hold that in. You can't mm -hmm. let it get to you. Mm -hmm. If you let it get to you, it'll every time you go fishing, it'll spin you out. That's I mean, awesome. There, there isn't since that happened. It's bad, but since that happened, there mm -hmm. isn't a day I go out on the water and don't think of that happening again. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I, I will always, I will always remember that. And it's, it's, it's crazy how far a bass can take you in this sport. I mean, oh yeah, one hundred percent. I mean, it truly is. I mean, you give me an interesting perspective too on on the bass, like you're saying, like that's uh, yeah. You know, and I think you know, Jeremy. I tell you this, you know, first podcast went really well, and uh, I think what's interesting too is his opportunities. Um, it's kind of just the beginning that just took us to current day, yeah. and uh, we want to bring you back Absolutely. for a second podcast and kind of talk about some other opportunities that you that. Uh, that came up that you took advantage of. Um, we'd like to bring you back and talk about that and then kind of see what's in, in Jeremy Radford's future. Absolutely. Uh, moving forward since Absolutely. you're only 19 Absolutely. years old. Yeah. You've done more than most people. I say all the time, gosh, and a lot of, <laughs> a lot of the old timers are like, gosh, what I wouldn't be able to do to, to have that opportunity that you, yeah. you have you know before you so yeah i mean absolutely and, and before we sign off here did you want to is there any sponsor or anything that you want to look at the camera and help rep them out or anything uh, like that or your dad or <laughs> i i gotta i gotta thank my family i mean without mm -hmm. them i wouldn't be here mm -hmm. and i gotta thank my dad because mm -hmm. you know he's absolutely. the captain and he's, he's taught me what i've known this man that's cool and i mean it's not really a sponsor but i with pro staff with blue tungsten mm -hmm. and they're they're never chip product i mean mm -hmm. You're sitting there punching grass all day. I mean, it sucks when you open your box and you see your tungsten's cracked up and all mm -hmm. the paint's up and they're bright and silver. But with the never chip product, I mean, it, it's unbelievable. I mean, mm -hmm. I've thrown them on the ground just just to try, and it's just they don't they don't chip. It's it's absolutely mm -hmm. awesome. And they they didn't have to. I mean, you got sent in a resume, and they didn't mm -hmm. have to accept it. But I truly thank them for mm -hmm. accepting it. But other than that, I mean. I appreciate you for bringing me on. And, and no, absolutely. I, I mean, I, I truly do thank you. And thank you all. Thank both of yeah, you all for You're very me. welcome. Yeah, and I think it's going to be a start of a long career. Oh, and I'd love to actually watch you when you get up to the big league. Just remember I us hope here so. at this little shop. That's right. <laughs> Come on back Jake's in. Bait and tackle. Uh, yeah. without, without Jake's bait and tackle, I mean, it, it wouldn't have happened. Because they got me started fishing. I mean, I, I remember walking in. Was, mm -hmm. I mean, I remember he would always say, you, you, need, you need to fish for our team you need to fish for our team <laughs> and at this point i'm recruiting them like yeah, seriously yeah, yeah. i, I mean at this point stick. i may have been 12 mm -hmm. 11 12 i mean and at that time i was i was nervous about doing it I'm mm -hmm. nervous i was i was really nervous to do it actually because i've never really i've never been a kid that wanted to do sports and everything i've mm -hmm. always wanted to do it either in the stand or on the water that's always where i was so when he said and i've, I've always fished tournaments with my dad so I thought it's like, man, it's just another tournament. So I, I got to give big thanks to Jared mm -hmm. for helping me get here because it kind of sounds cheesy, but without him, this tournament part probably wouldn't be here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it, it, that's what's interesting about you know the the fishing industry, uh, the, just the connections, the networking, yeah. the, the brotherhood. Um, you know, I think back to you know brotherhood. Uh, yeah. Brian yeah. and Kelly Henry. You know, they started Frederick County Bass back when their son, uh, who's now in the 24 probably you know way back they they started the frederick county you know bass club organization and then i kind of jumped in with them and was a boat captain you know and helped them out and so uh it's been it's been fun to watch it grow and 
and just you know give opportunities for a lot of different angles. So, Jeremy, thanks. Appreciate you coming. Absolutely. Out. Thank y'all. Yep. You're very welcome, sir. Thank you.